Um, I was thinking about nicknames. Uh, I'll tell you why uh, the purpose of it in just a moment. But there's some nicknames. People get nicknames. And these nicknames, I'm going to throw some out to you. And then you tell me if you know who this is, okay? This is going to be fun. Trust me. King of rock and roll. Elvis. Elvis. Elvis Presley. King of pop. Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. Queen of soul. Yes, okay, yeah, that one took just a second. How about the godfather of soul? James Brown. Okay, James Brown. Okay, how about some sports ones? Mr. October. Reggie Jackson. The bus. Any Steelers fans in the house? Jerome Bettis, come on. How about the mailman? Carl Malone, we know that one. How about primetime? Deion Sanders. How about The Glide? Clyde. Clyde Drexler. Yes, we are just outside of Portland. And how about his airness? Jumpman. Air Jordan. These people have these nicknames based upon some things that they've done, like Reggie Jackson, Mr. October. In October 1977, he cranks out three home runs and three pitches. Of course, Mr. October, you know who that is when you talk about him. King of Pop, Michael Jackson, uh, the greatest to ever do it. You have the bus, Jerome Bettis, Pittsburgh Steeler. That's because when you tried to tackle him, it was like trying to tackle a bus. This guy was like a, a bluebird coming down the football field. Mailman, Carl Malone, always delivered Air Jordan. He could jump so high. I mean, Air Jordan. It was like he was flying. He could jump so high. And so you see these people with these nicknames, and then you go, man, if I want to be able to, to jump, if I'm able to dunk, if I lower the hoop to about seven feet and I want to practice some dunks, I'm going to look at Michael Jordan. How can I dunk like him? How can I be like him? And so this morning, as we return to the book of Acts, we're looking at the end of Acts 8, which this chapter has really centered on a guy in scripture who had a nickname. His nickname, uh, not super creative, um, but, but very descriptive. His name, Philip, and in Acts 21, which is several years later, they start calling him Philip the Evangelist. Philip the Evangelist. And so this is who we're looking at. The evangelist, evangelist is a term that means preacher of the gospel, giver of the good news. And so he had this nickname amongst his brothers and sisters in Christ in the early church as someone who was the evangelist. So if you want to learn how to preach the good news, if you want to learn how to share the gospel, give the good news, I felt like this how-to would be great to learn from one who did it so well, how to be a witness, how to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Philip did. We first learned about Philip in Acts chapter six. He was amongst seven young men who were chosen to serve tables. Uh, there were some women in the church who weren't getting their daily distribution of food. And so they chose uh, Philip, Stephen, some others, and they were the ones chosen to do this task. That was his first task given in the early church, it seems. And so the next time that we see him is here in Acts chapter 8, after at the beginning of Acts chapter 8, sorry, where severe persecution comes upon the church at Jerusalem. And so the church is spread out. They're scattered. Now, Jesus had said in Acts 1.8 that his people, his disciples would be his witnesses which means they would testify of him. They would tell of something that they knew. He says, you will tell of me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So when the church spreads in Acts chapter eight, it says they spread from Jerusalem because of severe persecution. Then they go to Judea, they go to Samaria. And here at the end of Acts chapter eight, it's now about to go to the ends of the earth. Philip's gonna take it there. And in the next chapter, we're gonna see Paul Saul of Tarsus saved. And if Paul can be saved, anyone can be saved. And so we're looking here at this, which had been defined, Judea, 
Samaria to the ends of the earth, Jerusalem, Judea, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth, that his people would go as witnesses. Jesus said they would receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And so that witness gives testimony to what they know. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. You are to be my witnesses. He doesn't say you will witness. He's saying you will be my witnesses. That means that Jesus' followers uh, today are the ones who are to be his witnesses. It can't just be something that we do. He says, you will be that very thing. He said it to his disciples. He said it to you. He said it to me, to all who would choose him throughout history. And so we will be his witnesses. In the Great Commission, Jesus told his disciples to go, his followers to go make disciples to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And so Philip here is a willing witness. And so we're gonna look at this list. I have five points today for you that center on how to be a witness, a how-to. Now, this is by no means an exhaustive list. You might be able to come up with five more for yourself. That would be great. Uh, Perhaps you have a different approach or something like this. My point is engage, approach. And so let's look at these five points today. And let's start in Acts chapter 8, 26 to 27 is where we're going to read first. And we're going to really center today on how to be a witness and how to be an effective witness from the one in the early church who seems to be quite effective at doing just that. So verse 26 It comes after, I'll talk about that in a second. Verse 26, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, get ready and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. And so he got ready and went. He got ready and he went. And so the first point in how to be an effective witness for you and for me is get ready and go when the Lord says so. The angel came to him. He said, go. He said, go down this road, go to this place, go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. And the next thing we see about Philip, he got ready and he went. So Philip the interesting thing about Philip is that he had already been moved. We we talked about this. He'd already been Uh, moved from Jerusalem, he'd come to Samaria, which by the way was uh, not a place that many or most in that day would have wanted to go, especially if you were of Jewish lineage. And so he gets sent out, he goes to Samaria. And when he goes to Samaria, after the church was scattered, Philip begins preaching there. He begins preaching, he begins telling the good news of Jesus earlier we see in uh, chapter eight. And then from verse eight, we understand that as he was preaching, there was much rejoicing in that city. Some of the prominent people were coming to faith in Jesus. They were giving their lives to him. They were being baptized in Jesus' name. And so Philip has a very, very effective ministry on his hands. Things are going well for him. He's gone to this new town. The Lord moved him. And so we see this amazing ministry happening Even the apostles from Jerusalem, uh, two of the 12 come, I think it's Peter and John come, and they're like, man, yeah, this is a good thing. Let's lay hands on these guys. They're receiving the Holy Spirit. What do we see next in the midst of this thriving ministry? Now I want you to go down to that desert road from Jerusalem to Gaza. I want you to go down to that desert road. That's where he's now to go. Gaza was one of five uh, primary cities of the Philistines. It had been destroyed um, early in uh, first century BC and a new city was built near the coast. There were two roads that led from Jerusalem to Egypt and the one that he's being asked to go to was the worst one. It identifies it as the desert road. This is the road that people didn't really wanna go on this road. It was a route or a path that not many would have wanted to pursue. It would have taken Philip a couple days to journey this particular way. He did not know 
why he was going. He didn't know the final result of this journey. He just knew that he was to go and where he was to go to. He didn't know what was gonna happen once he got there. He was just told, I want you to go. I want you to go to this road, this undesirable desert road that few traveled or ever wanted to go. Those were the instructions. And verse 27, though he didn't know the the final result, he got up and he went. And that's a really important point for you and I, because sometimes we get in this life in Christ, we're going, no, I want all of the details. I want everything listed out. I want to know, you know, the introduction, the body of the scenario, and what the conclusion is going to be before I'm going to get up, before I'm going to go. And if I don't know all of these details, my answer is no. I'm not going to go unless I know, so no. Often we, we get that way, but, but here's the deal. This life in Christ that, that we live, Galatians uh, 5.25 says, if we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. That means that we go according to the Holy Spirit. We're, we're, we're responding to the Lord in this life. We're living in response to our Lord. The Lord will reveal his will But the point is, are we willing to let the Lord really take the lead? I mean, to really be in the lead in our lives. To really be the one who's guiding. To really be the one who's moving. Well, pastor, I don't think the Lord would really lead me into any kind of place I don't want to go. Oh, I see again and again in scripture and again and again, often even in my life, I got to go to some places I I don't really want to go. Philip is going to a place. He's leaving a a, a thriving ministry to go into the desert. He's leading the masses. He's leading the many. And he's going down this desert road. And the Lord will reveal his will to you and to me in many different ways. If we are filled with the Holy Spirit, if we're walking in his word, if if we have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, there are times where he'll reveal his will to us through his word, through uh, discernment, through just an impression. Oh, I I just sense this. I think it's it's so much more than just a feeling. It's, oh, you know, I I just have a sense. I, I, I need to respond here. I need to look into this. I need to go into this. And so he'll place things upon your heart He'll prompt your heart. But the question is, are we moldable? Are we pliable? Are we willing for the Lord to lead us? Are we those who are willing to go when the Lord says so and to whom he tells us to turn to? When the Lord says, speak to that person, go to that place, tell that person about me, reach out to this person, my encouragement is to be sensitive to the Lord. How often in your life do you you have those uh, impressions? How often do you understand a direction and you simply just say no? Well, the key to being an effective witness is to be willing to go when the Lord says so, to be willing to respond to his leading. I mean, Philip could have said, Lord, things are going really well here in Samaria. I mean, it's, it's, it's rocking, Lord. You really want this work to stop without me here? The Lord sends him on. You want me to leave the droves for the desert? Yeah, that's what he was asking him to do. Uh, Difficult. Uh, A place that that not few traveled, but the Lord had an appointment for him there. You know, there are times where uh, we're called to the crowds, and then there are times like the Lord where we're called to leave the 99 and go for the one. And that's what's happening here. Philip's leaving the 99. He's leaving the crowds. He's he's going after one. And the Lord had an appointment for him there. And the Lord was going to meet him there. And the Lord was going to meet another person there as well. And we often base effective ministry on how many, but let's base it upon 
who the Lord leads us to, where the Lord leads us. The, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4 that, that, that it's required of, of stewards that one be found faithful. It says we've been entrusted the word of God. We've been entrusted the, the, the um, mysteries of God's word. It's been given to us. And so it says it's required of stewards. It's required of those whom something's been entrusted to to be found faithful. If someone entrusts something to you, if someone gives something to you, they want you to be faithful with that thing. And that that, uh, word there, when it talks about in 1 Corinthians, it says we are servants of Christ. That word is under rower. That's what the word actually is in the Greek. It's under rower. It, it, it pictures someone who's on the lowest deck of the ship and the captain's up top. And he's saying, row harder, row slower, left side turn, right side turn, go back. It says we are the under rowers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's required of us who are uh, servants, under rowers, those who've been entrusted the word to be faithful with it. And so who are we faithful to? We're faithful to the Lord. And so let's be those who get ready and go uh, to whom and to where the Lord tells us to. Ask him what to do, what he desires of you. It can be as simple as going to the grocery store and saying, Lord, do you have something for me at this grocery store today? Is there someone who you want me to speak with? You know, it was really interesting um, I try to be careful about some of the things that, <laughs> I try to be careful about some of the things that I like tell you that I do. And I just have been impressed upon my heart to like, you know, Paul says, follow me as I follow Jesus. And so, uh, you know, I don't want any rewards in heaven to be taken from me because you're like, oh, that was cool. He did that. So don't think this is like something cool about me. I just want to be careful, especially when it comes to like, oh, giving money to someone or, you know, like um, Jesus talks about that. Like you don't don't sound the alarm so that your reward in heaven can be great. So I want to do this in the most humble way, but I preface that now with a clear conscience to tell you that Kathy and I um, a, a while back we had decided that we would put a certain um, number dollar amount like per month so that we could like do random acts of of giving or kindness to people. Um, which would be really great if you can budget that in. I think that that would be great if you can do that. And it was like the first day that we did that, um, the first day that we had decided to do that, we, I went to the store and I was like, Lord, give me an opportunity. You know, like, you know, when you have like cash in your wallet, you're just like ready to spend it. And I was like, Lord, give me an opportunity here. And so I'm going to the store. I mean, I'm like on high alert, like, Lord, who, who can I give to? It was so cool because my heart going in was like, oh, I want to give. Well, guess what? I didn't see anyone, you know, um, and I'm going through the line at the store and the person in front of me had insufficient funds to pay for their groceries. Well, it was like four times the amount we had agreed on. But I'm like, hey, this is it. This is it. Like, you know, I'm going to give more than, than we even thought. And, and I'll just explain it to Kathy later. But <laughs> that'll make up for four months of this thing. But, but it was like that first day. And that was so exciting because I, I just felt like it was my opportunity to partner with the Lord there. Like, oh, I have this heart, I have this intent, I want to do this. And so I'm willing to go and the Lord says so. I'm just waiting, looking for that opportunity. And the Lord provided it right there. So get ready and go when the Lord says so. And then know that like, you know, it may just be like $20 in your, in your wallet. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. And then you just go out and then you trust the Lord to reveal an opportunity for you if he puts that on your heart. Um, if he doesn't put that on your heart, ask him maybe something else he would put on your heart. That was just one idea. Next thing is put no borders on who you share the good news to. We do that, don't we? Yeah, 
<laughs> that person doesn't want to hear about the Lord, the, or they live a certain way, or they look a certain way, or they operate a certain way, or, or I know them. So I, that person's kind of like off limits when it comes to this. I've kind of put borders around that person. Uh, verse 27 to 29 says, Philip got ready and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. So, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship and he was returning and sitting in his chariot and reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join his chariot. So he goes down this desert road and the picture that we get is like, he's, he's like watching, he's looking for an opportunity. And there's this Ethiopian eunuch in a chariot, he sees the chariot and the Holy Spirit says, go there. So Ethiopia was a large kingdom from the south of Egypt. In those days, it was considered um, by uh, the, the Greeks and the Romans as the ends of the world, the, the outer limits of the world. So uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So here's this man here from uh, Ethiopia, and he's an Ethiopian eunuch, and he's a noted, noted here as a court official of Candace of the Ethiopians. And so Candace, now catch this, Candace was not this, uh, Candace was not his, his uh, boss's name. Candace was actually a title. You were a, a Candace in, in Ethiopia. They had this term Candace, and so it wasn't like her name would be like Candy for short or something like this. No, she was a Candace. It was just like there was uh, Caesar or there was Pharaoh. Uh, these were not the person name. That was a title that they carried. And so he was a court official for Candace. And so catch this, Ethiopian kings were considered by their people to be incarnations of the quote unquote sun god. They had a, a sun god and the Ethiopian kings were considered to be incarnations of this sun god. And because they were considered the sun god, they were not um, willing to administrate uh, their kingdom. And so they had a queen mother who would administrate the kingdom. That was a Candace. So the sun god king, I can't do any of that work. That's for mom. So, you know, mama's boy. And he would go, come on, guys. Um, so he would go get mom. Mom did it all for him. And so this Ethiopian eunuch was very powerful because really the one who was administrating the kingdom was the Candace. And so the Ethiopian eunuch is very pow powerful in his own land. And he had left his homeland to come and worship in Jerusalem, which gives us the indication that he uh, had attempted to or had uh, tried to convert to uh, Judaism. So he desired to be uh, Jewish. So he had gone to worship there in Jerusalem, a convert. In verse 28, it says he was... As he was returning, so he's returning from Jerusalem to Ethiopia, he's sitting in his chariot and he was reading the Bible or he's reading the Old Testament scriptures, Isaiah the prophet. And so there are some indications here of the eunuch's power. First of all, he was not driving his own chariot. He had a driver. Um, secondly, he was reading a scroll of the scriptures, which would have been a handwritten copy. It would have been very, very expensive and difficult for a Gentile to have a copy of the scriptures. So he's reading a scroll of the scriptures. He had power, he had prestige, and he's pouring over the book of Isaiah. What will be made clear uh, for this man is that something's missing. He doesn't understand what he's reading. He doesn't understand what he's looking at. Uh, the point here is that upon first glance from Philip to this man, this man would give off the impression that he had need of nothing. He was wealthy. He was prestigious. He had authority in his land. I doubt many people would uh, approach him assuming he didn't know something. 
The fact of the matter is that we often look at someone and say, oh, they have need of nothing, so they don't need Jesus. Or they have need of nothing, so there's nothing that I can offer them. But if you're a steward of the mysteries of God, if you're a steward of the truth of God's word, uh, then those who do not know him have much to receive from you, have much that you can give them. J. Warner Wallace, he wrote a book called Cold, Cra- Cold Case Christianity. If you ever want a good apologetic, uh, pull up his book. Um, he was an LA homicide detective and he wrote a book. He was not a believer. He was an atheist, didn't believe in God. He wrote a book uh, and basically used the principles from his being a homicide detective uh, to uh, find facts about Jesus Christ. Uh, Ultimately, he would give his life over to Jesus Christ, but he gave this book for us to read. J. Warner Wallace, who wrote this book, had started attending a church in his mid-30s, and he was learning about Jesus in the middle of his career. He said when he started going to church, he was just investigating about Christ. And he said that as he started going to church, one of the things that struck him that he wondered a lot was how is it that he had gotten that far in his life without anyone really sharing Jesus with him? I'm in my mid-30s, I'm married now. And he said it, it struck him, for he and his wife both, that, that no one really shared Jesus with him. No one really talked to him about Jesus. He grew up in Southern California. And he talks about the fact that no one ever made it clear to him and how comfortable he was in his life without Christ. I don't need need someone like Jesus. He talks about how comfortable he was, but when he started to understand the scriptures, when he started to look into this personally, what he says is that, things started to change. I wonder how many people looked at him, this LA homicide detective in his life and said, he won't listen. He's a know-it-all. He's got it all figured out. He's kind of set in his ways. And by his own admission, he was. But he talks about by his own admission how no one came and spoke to him. And I think that there are people in our lives who we put borders on them. And so my encouragement is don't put borders on who you share the good news to. Be willing to talk and converse with people about Jesus. And I think when you do, you'll actually be challenged in your own faith. Like, oh, I didn't think about that, but I'm gonna look into it. I mean, there are things in this life that are so important to us that we're gonna find the facts. I mean, we're in that day, right? We're gonna find the facts to support what we think about things. Well, let's find the facts. Let's find the truth to support our life in Christ as well. The bottom line is, is that um, uh, no one is beyond the borders of Jesus Christ. He can break through those borders, break through those barriers. Next week, we'll see uh, Paul the apostle saved. But the point is Romans 10, 13 to 15, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on him. And then Paul continues, how then are they to call upon him whom they've not believed? So if they don't believe on, if they, if they don't believe in him, they can't call on him. How are they to believe in the one they haven't heard? If they haven't heard about him, they can't believe in him. And how are they to hear without a preacher, without an evangelist? How are they to preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. We looked at this when we were in the the Christmas season. The angels announced to the shepherds, behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all people, for all people, not some people not certain people. The good news of great joy is available for all people. G. Campbell Morgan, he was a British evangelist, preacher, teacher. He said this, if Christ is hindered, it is because some Philip is not willing to go. Christ is hindered, it's because we're not willing to go. Put no borders on who you share the good news to. Next point is don't let tact keep you from contact. 
tact, like, I got to plot it out. I got to get everything just right. I got to get all my ducks in a row. I got to get all my bullet points together before I make kingdom contact with someone. No, don't let tact keep you from contact. The spirit said to Philip, go and join his chariot. I love this. Philip ran. Philip ran. He ran up to the chariot. He heard him reading and he asked this bold question. This is not a tactical question. Do you know what you're reading? Do you understand what you're reading about? I mean, the Lord, you know, he knows. The Lord sent him over to this chariot. Do you understand what you're reading? He asks him. Philip gets close. He hears the man reading aloud from Isaiah. Reading aloud was common custom in the ancient world, by the way. People would would read aloud as they're reading. So he hears him as he comes up on his chariot. Philip knows what he's talking about. And so this man is reading. And to approach a man of prestige, power, a man of great authority and say, do you know what you're even reading? I mean, that was bold. The Bible says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be able to make that contact and get beyond just tact alone. But this is an excellent example for you and for me to be a witness. We find out what a person's into. What are they interested in? And start to ask questions. Hey, tell me about that. Tell me what that means to you. And we start asking questions. What are they studying? What are they reading? What are some of the questions that they have about life in general? And we can begin to have these kingdom conversations. Philip hears him reading and asks the question, do you understand what you are reading? Do you understand what that's all about? A couple of months ago, I was at the gas station and... The, the, the gas station attendant came up, you know, what would you like? And so I tell him what I would like. And I noticed that he was wearing a mask and his mask said, as above, so below. I thought, oh, that's interesting. And so I said, hey, what does your mask mean? As above, so below. Tell me about it. What does it mean? And he, he said, um, well, it means as above, so below. I said, oh, like... I mean, I'm thinking, oh, like Jesus says, you know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I said, like that? Like, is that what, like, that's what as above, so below means to me. And he goes, uh, I'm not a real spiritual or religious person. I said, okay, still, what does as above, so below mean? Because <laughs> I'm not sure. I just see your mask here. And so he actually pulled out his phone to look up what the definition of as above, so below is. And this is, I, this is what he said. I had to write it down. It says, what happens on earth is a result of what happens in a realm that consists of various philosophies and mystery religions. I said, okay, well, I know a real, <laughs> I know an interesting text. Jesus gave this prayer. He talks about the fact that like, you know, God is, is in control, like, of the earth, you know, as it is in heaven. Like, I pray that, like, I pray that way. So this is really interesting. And he said, well, I'm not really for Jesus. He said, I'm more for the other side. It's like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. I said, like, what side? And he said, the dark side. Oh, I said, well, you know, and I'm like, this is not tactical, okay? This is just contactical. This is just, I'm making contact. I just said, well, okay, so you're for the dark side. So you acknowledge, because you're, you acknowledge the dark side, you acknowledge that there's light. You acknowledge that there's a light side and that there's a dark side, yes? Jesus was the light of the world? He said, I don't, I don't like Jesus. I don't really like his followers. You know, they, they, uh, they're, he says, um, what did he say? I, I, I had to write this down because I wanted to make sure I, because I don't like them. Oh, I said, I'm a Jesus follower and I don't think you should choose or deny Jesus based on his followers. I think you should look at him personally because he's the light of the world. So you should look at Jesus personally 
And he said, well, his followers annoy me. I said, really? How come? Because they keep talking to me. <laughs> well, tell me what you really think. Uh, and so and when he said that, I said, they do really? I said, like, they keep talking to you when you're out here? And he's like, yeah. And then he just walked away really swiftly. And that was the end of our engagement. So this wasn't like some, I'm not like, you know, normally I like to give you the stories where there's like a, a, an intro, a body, and a conclusion. I don't know the conclusion in this guy's life. But I was willing to make contact and kind of just say, hey, you know what, whatever tactical things, like, Lord, I'm just asking for that from you right now. We were able to have a conversation. We were able to talk about um, church. One thing I left out is he had had some uh, experience uh, growing up. It sounds like he, he had some experience with the church. And so we talked about that. And as he walked away, I just encouraged him, hey, praying for you. And that was it. But I wanted to speak to him in such a way. And I wanted to take the opportunity. Because sometimes we just let opportunities pass us by because A, we're not sure what to say or how to do it. Rather than just trust the Lord, like, give me the words. God, I just need the words from you here. And I'm just willing to, to lean in. And I'm just willing to lean upon the Lord and ask questions. Stop, look, listen, ask questions. The question is for you, are you asking questions of others? for the purpose of kingdom contact. Hey, what's going on in your life? How are you doing? What are you going through? What are you into? And then be willing to go there with them. What do they need to know? What are their questions? We all have questions. I think that right now, these last two years have been a time where there are a lot more questions than answers. And the cool thing is, is that we know the final answer. And so we can work our way back from that. That's a beautiful thing. Acts 31, uh, 831, then Philip says, because he, he goes up to him, he goes up to the man and he says, do you know what you're reading? And the man says, how could I, unless someone guides me? How could I know? What? How could I know unless someone guides me? Hey, can you come into my chariot? I mean, I doubt he expected that. He goes, do you know what you're reading? The guy says, how could I know what I'm reading? I need someone to guide me. Can you come into my chariot? And so the next point is, be ready to be the someone God sends to guide. Be ready to be that someone. Philip was ready to be that someone. He was willing to make contact. He was willing to ask questions and then go sit with him. And ultimately he will share his answers. In verse 32 to 34, it says the passage of scripture he was reading was he was led like a sheep to slaughter and a lamb that is silent before its shearer. So he did not open his mouth. In humiliation, his justice was taken away. Who will describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, please tell me who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Isaiah 53 was what he was reading. That is a passage that's talking about Jesus. And we're not surprised that he's confused because in uh, Judaism, some believed that that was a reference to the nation Israel. Some believed that Isaiah was talking about himself and others believed that that was talking about the Messiah who at that point they had thought they did not think had come. And so Philip's hearing him talk about this, this picture that is so powerful of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he begins speaking to him about Jesus Christ. It says he opened up his mouth, Acts 8, 35, beginning from the scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Philip was willing to ask questions. He was willing to find out what this person was all about. And he was willing to be the someone that God sent to guide. He was willing to be that person. He was willing to, 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 to get into the chariot and talk about uh, Jesus with this person. We live in a day that's puzzled, a day that's perplexed in many ways, a world that's largely been turned upside uh, and, and in many ways the wrong way. And we have the opportunity to point people to Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Let's be willing. Let's be Jesus people who are willing to guide people, 
to be that someone. How will I know unless someone guides me? Yeah, I, 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 I'm willing to be that someone. I might not be the perfect someone. I might not have been the perfect someone for that guy with as above, so below, but I was someone willing. I think we just need to be someone willing. Hey, I'm willing to have this conversation. Let's not walk away from opportunities where God may be sending you and me to be that someone sent to guide. In your hearts, 1 Peter 3.15, revere Christ as Lord, always prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks for the hope that you have. The most powerful opportunities that I have had in leading people to Jesus Christ has been because I'm willing to be someone God sent. I'm willing to just, hey, yeah, okay, let's talk. Let's, let's figure this out together. Let's have a, a good conversation together. Let's do this thing. And Philip was willing to open his mouth and tell of scriptures. And so that's very important. Being that someone God sent, we gotta open our mouth about the things of Christ, the things of our Lord. And, and so it's good to know some scripture. Like, John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Romans 6, 23, the, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Uh, Acts 4, 12, there's salvation in no other name. We quoted one earlier, Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We can know some scriptures and, and, and just kind of work from there. And then when someone gives you a question, like, you know, maybe they know how to throw you curveballs. I mean, you also can be willing to say, you know what? I'm not sure, but I'll look into that. And so there's three resources that I just want to mention to you that you can get apps for. You can, if, if you just need, like, if you have a quick question or you're struggling with something, there's a website called gotquestions.com, gotquestions.com. When I share resources, it's interesting because I can't tell you that 100% of everything that's written on gotquestions.com is like right where I stand theologically. So test and approve it. But I would say most of the things that I read there are really, really good. Really, really good. Like, and, and the other stuff's good too. It just is gonna cause some some, you know, more good questions for you. Uh, gotquestions.com, blueletterbible.org. Just blue letter Bible. That's a place where you can go. They have like the Greek words. You can look up like, what does this word actually mean? They have commentaries where, commentaries where these Bible scholars will go in and uh, explain what, what they think. And then you'll even see like four or five Bible scholars and how there's some differences even in the way they might look at a particular text. And that helps you to know where there's room on a certain texts. And the other one is EnduringWord.com. EnduringWord.com is a, a commentary. I think it's got every book of the Bible and all of these have apps and you can just put them around your phone and hey, I have a question about that scripture. I'm, I'm curious what that means. Uh, man, check it out. They all have apps, but these tools and resources will help us to be that someone God sends to guide. And so we're learning, we're growing, but we're also helping people learn, helping people, people guide, helping guide people. So be willing to um, do that. And the last thing is be willing to ask for an answer. Uh, last point is seek a response. Verse 36, as they went along the road, they came to the water and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? He ordered that chariot to stop and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he was baptized. And they came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch no longer saw him, but went his way rejoicing. Philip found himself at Azotus and he passed through. He went through preaching the gospel to all cities until he came to Caesarea. Caesarea. Some of your translations, you might see uh, verse 37 there. Uh, verse 37, um, what prevents me from being baptized? And then it, it says that Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And the man answered and said, 
I believe Jesus Christ is the, the son of God. The reason why newer translations don't have that verse is because the oldest and most reliable transcripts do not have that verse in them. And so uh, in, in, in an effort to try and have just the purest form of, of scripture, or maybe yours has brackets on it that say like some of the earliest manuscripts don't have this text in. And so yeah, that's just important for you to know as you're reading the Bible, if you see those brackets or if it goes from 36 to 38, that's because these Bible scholars, they're, they're trying to do the best job that they can to make sure that the Bible is in its true and purest form possible. What we do understand is that there had to be some uh, response uh, from this man, some confirmation, some affirmation of his life in Christ. And so that gives us uh, certainly an example of what could have been we know that when we're sharing Jesus, however, that everyone must respond personally. Jesus said in Matthew 16 to his disciples, to his followers, who do the people say I am? They say who the people say. And then he says, who do you say that I am? And so we're asking people, who do you say that he is? And so this eunuch, he desired to be baptized uh, water baptism is, was then in the New Testament and is today an outward visible sign of someone's inward relationship, personal identification with faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew 28, 19 is where Jesus talks about it. It gives evidence to that inner change. That person's born again. It signifies the believer's death to the old life and resurrection into new life. We're excited for some people who are taking that step Tonight, I would even say, if you haven't been baptized, I encourage you to, 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 to be baptized. We're able to walk in that newness of life. We're buried with Christ. We're unified with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. And it's this outward sign going down, uh, coming up. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, if you haven't been baptized, hey, there's water here. What prevents you from being baptized tonight? In fact, even with some of the health and safety protocols, I was like, ah, should we move it? But I'm like, hey, there's water here. Let's not prevent from being baptized. It's gonna be a beautiful thing. I encourage you to get baptized if you haven't. Anyway, it says, after uh, being baptized, the Lord snatches Philip away. That was interesting. That's like Holy Spirit transportation. He had somewhere for Philip to be that was not there. Philip had done his job. He knew Philip was gonna go anyway. I mean, he'd proven that he was gonna go, so he just takes him. He, he takes him over to where he needs to go. Philip would ultimately end up in Caesarea. And in Acts 21, we see that he has a house there, four daughters who are prophesying. So he stays there in Caesarea. This Ethiopian eunuch, we don't know much about him other than this from scripture, but we know from church history or we learn from church history that this Ethiopian eunuch may very well have been uh, the one who went and shared the gospel in Ethiopia and in and throughout Africa, which is really, really cool. What I want to circle as we close here is that as Philip was taken, as he's transported, and that Ethiopian eunuch comes out of the water, it says that that Ethiopian eunuch went with much rejoicing. Earlier in verse 8 of chapter 8, it said that after Philip preached the good news to the people of Samaria, the people in the city we're rejoicing. Oh, I don't know about you, but that's the way I want to leave people. Rejoicing. Inwardly saved, cleansed, come to faith in Jesus Christ, knowing that they have the joy of the Lord in their life. Sure, questions come. Sure, interactions come. Sure, it can be sometimes difficult to engage but let's not get lost in tact and make kingdom contact because what I believe wholeheartedly is when we do that and these people come to choose Jesus wholeheartedly, when these people choose him as their personal Lord and Savior, we will leave those interactions and those people will be rejoicing. And so as we close today, as the worship team comes up, 
Just want to remind you of these five points, how to be a witness. Get ready and go when the Lord says so. Put no borders on who you share the good news to. Don't let tact keep you from contact. Be ready to be the someone God sends and seek a response. Psalm 107 2 says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let's be those who are willing to say so. And as you close your eyes, as you bow your heads today, maybe there's someone who you've put borders around. No, I won't talk to them about Jesus. They don't want to hear it. They're not interested. Maybe you put borders around this person. And I ask you to ask the Lord, to just seek the Lord today. Lord, where do you want me to go? And Lord, I'm willing to go when you say so. Who do you want to send me to, Lord? And just be <clears throat> like Isaiah, here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am, Lord. If not you, then who? Here I am, Lord. Send me to ask those questions. Send me to have those conversations. Send me to be your witness. We love you and we thank you, Lord Jesus. All God's people say, amen.